This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. The Dallas Cowboys select Tyler Smith. And now, your host, Kyle Yeomans. Hey there, everybody. Welcome into the Draft Show presented by Miller Lite. We are live from the Indiana Convention Center in the 2023 NFL Combine on Radio Row. We are on site for day number three of the Combine this year. Alongside Aisha Morrison, I'm Kyle Yeomans. We are pleased to be joined by a very special guest. We've got Vice President of Player Personnel, Will McClay, joining us now. And Will... It's been a busy week for you already. How's it been going? It's great. You said it was day number three. I feel like it's day number 12. <laughs> it feels it's like it, right? how it runs you know, during the combine. What has this combine been like compared to some of the ones that you've had in the past? Um, it's it's very, very similar. I just think that um, what what's changed is they're improving the player experience, which means it's a little longer day, a little different for the rest of us that are trying to do our job, but it's the same old deal. Oh, man, overall, I mean, it, it really feels like that because they pushed everything back a little bit. The interviews, the drills, and it keeps you here longer, right? Yeah, I mean, today we started interviews at 8 in the morning, and Ooh. then we'll go till 11 o'clock at night with that break in between of the workouts. So. Okay, what do you get to eat in the middle? That's, um, that's what, what we got to talk about. Uh, <laughs> well, whatever's up in the suite, and, and, and you know, we roll with it. You Probably mentioned the, the player experience as being important and something you guys are prioritizing. What are ways that you, you folks are trying to prioritize and make the players experience better i think what we're trying to do the league is trying to and the uh, the combine committee is trying to give the players more opportunity to rest before their events so that they're fresher um just giving them a better overall experience uh in, in you know in their introduction to the nfl overall you you mentioned kind of the overall experience it, has that shifted from a league-wide scenario through from your early days to, to what it is now, and it's become more player-centric, but how has it changed for an executive like yourself? Uh, you know, we have to adjust, and, and you know, and in this game, it, it, everybody has to adjust, and, and, and there's different things that you have to do to be able to figure out how to work within the conditions that you have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're going to give us a set of rules. We abide by those rules, and we want to make the best of it. And, and the number one thing is for us is getting the opportunity to uh, converse with the players, find out who they are, uh, just get a little bit more information. Is that one of your favorite parts of the the process? Is getting to know those guys? Yeah. yeah um, you know, we're in a people business. I've said this before. Mm -hmm. We're asking people about people, uh, and, you know, we're gathering that information. So now is our opportunity to find out if that information we gather was right, but also to put our own, uh, you know, feelings to what we think about the player from interacting with them. Yeah, put the face to the name. Yes. For me, it's also just seeing these guys myself, seeing their build, seeing how they interact, just seeing how they interact with their peers. Yes. A lot of them just, a lot of them just taking the time to talk about the connections that they have within some of the NFL teams already. And, and it's kind of cool to hear, even from the Cowboys standpoint, so many of the players have been like, like, yeah, you know, Jake Ferguson is a guy I reach out to. And, and there's it's cool to know that in the Cowboys locker room, there's gentlemen that are really reaching out to these guys and being encouraging them to them about the process and letting them understand it. I thought that was something that stood out to me is there seems like some real camaraderie that's here in this uh, class as well. Yeah, there's a there's a brotherhood amongst these guys. And, um, again, they all kind of they know each other. Like we're talking <laughs> to guys in the room. And, uh, you know, like you said, there were players that say, okay, hey, I reached out to so-and-so on your team to to kind of give us some advice but um that's the unique part about it and what we're trying to do is find those guys that you think you not only you got to be good football players you got to be some all that but who fits into the culture right because the important part of the, the the successful teams is that they have a culture so uh you know you set that standard and you you know we we, we get that feeling from guys as to okay they would fit and they, you know those, those sort that sort of information is there a different type of guys guy that you guys target whenever it comes to that, when it comes to the off the field and the, the, the culture fit that you guys bring to the table from maybe the Jason Garrett days into the Mike McCarthy days. Has there been a switch on the type of personnel that you look for? Not really. I mean, um, you know, every system has type of players that they want. Um, our objective on the scouting side is to evaluate guys regardless of the system, give them their value, and then we see if they fit in. Yeah. Overall, when you look at this draft class, what stands out to you the most about some of those individuals that you've gotten to talk to so far? Where do they rank in terms of uh, 
kind of some of the classes that you've had in the past? Um, I, you know, every year it kind of changes, and now you have those those players that had the COVID year. They're a little bit older. I think there are players that are older that are now in the, um, you know, up for the draft. You know, there's some yeah. 24, 25-year-old players, so that's something that we take into consideration. But these guys are also um, very cognizant of their own personal brand. Uh, so that's, you know, it's a unique uh, set of circumstances that we have to, kind of figure out the, the whole nil and mm. you know players are getting paid now in college and why do they stay why do they come out and then how important is football to them because you know when i was coming out way back in the day you know i got 20 bucks to last me two <laughs> weeks well now they're getting these uh you know big money deals so finding out just how important football is to them and 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 being aware that they know about business yeah you know i want to circle back to that in a couple of moments but, but while we do have dane brugler on the headset as well we're adding a fourth person in the you, man. See you. See you. you were having some fun on radio row it's radio row it's a little bit hectic but we're glad to have you on the show well uh i want to circle back to to the nil does that make your job harder does that make the scouting job harder because it's just another added element to throw into to the table it's something else you have to figure out that you have to dig into. And everybody's motivation's different. It's like the COVID year. It's just another – the COVID year, there were some guys that did not play that year that, you know, you go into it saying, oh, well, we want guys to play. Well, as you got further along, what were the reasoning – you know, excuse me, the reasons why you didn't. And that gives you another layer of the player. What were some of the reasons that you still took Micah Parsons that year whenever he came off of a COVID year that he didn't play? Well, you know, his reasoning. Big Ten wasn't going to play, and then they said they were going to play. Mm-hmm. I had made the decision. So they all had these different, um, you know, environments that they had to navigate through. And you want to hear the thought process as to why they did it and then check out the sincerity and dig and see if the information matches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You mentioned how there's some older players in this draft class, even from, like, offensive line. Some of these DBs are five-year starters. Mm-hmm. How is that something that you guys are looking at, the experience of, of some of these players that are deciding to stay longer and, and finish and kind of perfect their craft in college? You, you look at it both ways with that, the number of snaps they've taken, how long they played, how many games they've started. But then you also look at it from a, a longevity term. Um, because when you sign a contract, there's a difference when a guy's 22 and a guy's 25, yes, and you start talking about second, you, you know, second contracts and things like that. All you know, pieces of information that we throw into the mix. I'm really interested in uh, how you guys look at positional value, uh, especially when, uh, let's take tight end, for example. Do, how much do you look at, uh, you know, the, say the past 15 years, tight ends drafted in the first round, what that looks like compared to tight ends drafted in the third round, fourth round, and you know, do, you, do you look at certain positions and say, you know what, we feel comfortable maybe waiting, or is it just it's a draft-by-draft draft basis where you know you have to really take each draft for what it is? To me, it's draft-by-draft draft basis, but you've also got to pay attention to the historical, because that kind of gives you a balance in you know, how you look at and do things. I think um, I really like to look at, you know, every team goes into the draft with needs. Right. Um, you look at your needs, you look at the value, you look at the depth, uh, and, and, and it kind of gives you an idea as to how to play that, you know, that, 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 that market. Yeah. That's interesting because is it different from team to team? Do you have your own set history that you go back on and you kind of rely on going back and saying, okay, maybe it didn't work out with this guy initially. Maybe the position value was a little bit skewed. Um, Yeah, I think some of it's historical, but some of it is um, the conditions that you're faced with at the time. You know, uh, we we talk about the past, but we have to win now. So you look at those trends and you got to figure out how you get the best players at the right value for what you need. Hmm. Looking at this draft, the offensive line, the offensive tackle position or the guard position, it seems kind of. Not thin, but less less top heavy. There are some and some good tackles in this draft. Doing what you did with Tyler Smith last year, he was able the versatility that he showed, mm-hmm. being able to play guard and left tackle, actually saved you in a lot of instances. Is that something that you guys are looking forward looking for moving forward? Is the fact that you know you want some versatility from your offensive linemen? I think you have to have that because there's not enough quality offensive linemen for 32 teams for everybody to have a solid offensive line. So what you look for is versatility. You look for guys that um, have the opportunity to grow and and, and improve their skill set. The college game is different from the NFL game. So you want to get guys that come into the situation and that can pick up the trends and do the things and apply those techniques that they're being taught. Because the college game and the NFL game is still different. You want guys that can develop. Do you see any tackles? Have you seen any tackles? 
tackles that you think you don't have to say the name, but <laughs> have you seen any tackles that you think do have the ability to have some flex at guard or that you could move to guard at maybe a center that could be a guard also? Yes. Well, part of our deal, you know, you, you look for athletic people. The most athletic linemen are usually on the outside. Now, do they have the ability to move inside and to process? The further you move inside, the more information you got to consume and, you know, dissect. So you want to find out, are they athletic enough? But then can they handle the other things when they go down inside? Mm-hmm. So you're looking for those versatile guys. It's a little broad, but... What's the number one objective of this week for you and your staff? It's, you know, obviously you want to find out more about these players, but if you're leaving Indianapolis, what's the one thing you want to make sure that you have accomplished as a group? Um, I think you want to verify the information that you already have. Um, you want to confirm that. And then, but I think we also, I talk to our group and, you know, we get our coaches involved. We want to find our feelings about the guy, not what somebody else has told us, but how, you know, at least from this experience and which guys do we want to dig further on from this exposure, from the information we already have. It's just kind of adding stuff to make sure that we have the right guy for us it's uh, the whole tyler smith situation we Mm. went through it and we spent enough time with him to know maybe people didn't you know (laughs) realize what we realized so you know we go through our process to say that's a dallas cowboy and you know we want to hit all the markers that's an important part about the draft like that's one thing that i'm learning myself is to block out other people's opinions and really focus on what I see and what I believe in the player and compiling all of the information to mm-hmm. come to a conclusion. So you're just you're just doing your due diligence, that's I a, guess, yeah. That's <laughs> a big part of it. I mean that's why I enjoy talking to Dane, you know, because this is a, a an information deal. So people gather their opinions that you see on, you know, NFL Network and ESPN or their top. T- well, they're talking to people about players, and so that's how they formulate their deal. But they don't have as much information, and we have to talk about what's important for us. Um, every organization is different, and they have different elements, and there's different, you know, there's players that can fit in in some spots and players that can't. Is there a, a, an added element of this? This is a draft and develop organization. They have been for quite some time, and, and it's been successful for quite some time in that regard as well. But is there an added element of the drafting has gone so well as of late that at some point it, it won't hit that again? Well, what what helps you continue pushing to try and not let that happen? Well, I think we're hoping that it continues to go that way because we have a <laughs> system that we believe in. Yeah. You know, I love the way that our scouts go out on the road. They they're the GMs of their areas, and, and, and they feel that importance and, and value to the organization by approaching their job that way. We have a way that we do things. You follow that way, and then you come to a conclusion. And then um, not having an ego because part of our process is everybody's involved, and it goes from you know September when they go out until up until you know the draft meetings and everything else. So they have that input, and we feel like uh, with that recipe that nobody's an expert. I mean, if yeah. we were – Bat- batting 60 percent you know we'd be doing great doing pretty good we'd be doing pretty you know, yeah. we're like baseball players so <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's the collective process um everybody has a grade they put their grade on we don't talk about the grade and if there's variance in it the way i feel about it there's variance there's somewhere in the middle and that's where that grade usually you know you, you average them out and that's probably where that player is because we value the input of everybody you've been doing this for so long now I- i'm really interested in how what have you? What's the biggest thing you have learned since you started in this role, mm. compared to now? That uh, you know, because obviously every year brings something different. You learn uh, the most important thing, most important aspect of an evaluator is to, to self-evaluate mm-hmm. and understand. Okay, maybe did we get this wrong? Did I see this right? Uh, but what's one thing maybe from when you started in this role till now that you've really learned? Um, I've become. Um more and more willing to understand my biases you know everybody has biases <laughs> yeah. there's you know there's there's uh I, I was a db i know i look like a nose guard but i was <laughs> i was a corner and there are certain ways that i was taught and learned the game yeah. that i see somebody doing it and when i was coaching i wouldn't coach it that way and so i would have a bias and i, and I still have biases there's just certain things that I believe in. Now, that's my bias. And each individual person in our uh, in our department, based on where they came from, based on what they've done, they have their biases. So recognizing that and, you know, understanding, you know, what biases you have and saying, all right, maybe I'm not right on this and being able to listen to everybody else and kind of figure it out. I'm still going to have my principles, my beliefs, but I know when I have a bias. I have a deal that mm. – um, 
there's a certain position. If you play that position and you wear a towel, that's like my bias. I'm like, no, you're supposed to, you know, it's not supposed to be coming out of your nose. You're supposed to be nasty. That's an initial bias. I know it when I see it that's on tape. That's funny. Yeah, right. That's Interesting. Uh, are there any other biases you could share? Because I'm intrigued by that that first one. The first one was that. I wasn't that was prepared out, for that. Yeah, I, that was kind of out of the blue. I like it. I thought um, it was going to be something technical. And you, no, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. There's, like, there's, there's some technical things. Like, <laughs> um, again, it's, it's, it's footwork. I mean, maybe because I have seen things a certain way and I was taught football way back in the day, it's leveraging angles. And so I look at the game differently than somebody who might be, you know, uh, uh, you know, maybe not as well versed in, you know, being around the game as long, but they're really good at their job. They might not see what I see or I might not see what they see. I think that uh, it, it, it there are some things that uh, I won't. I won't reveal right oh, now. Oh, there's so many wheels turning yeah, right now, yeah, and yeah. I wish. I wish we could hear it. I yeah. really would do. Uh, kind of along those same lines, but not necessarily exactly along the same lines. This is a, a front office. This is a staff that hasn't necessarily drafted undersized players in the past at certain positions, most notably wide receiver. There are a lot of really good wide receivers in this draft class. Is that something that is still on the table moving forward? Is that something that the staff would look into if the right guy fit? Well, yeah, it's, it's if the right guy fits. I mean, the, you you build your team. Football, you know, it's a game of angles and leverage, and you we're all looking for the, you know, that's why we're at the combine. We want to measure and want to see how tall they are, how long their arms are, how fast they run. That builds a profile. But then, um, you know, you have to figure out what you're looking for, but not just for that situation, but for the long run. Yeah. So typically, the bigger, longer, more athletic players they play in the league, long, there's more of those guys. But um, the game has become so different now. It's spread out. It's played laterally and vertically. It's not as much, you know, run game. So you have to look at it differently, and you kind of assess the trends and kind of figure out, you know what fits what you do and you also have to have which i think we do have is a coaching staff that's willing to use the abilities of the guys that you pick because it's Mm -hmm. you know there's you hear about systems well if there's a system and you're trying to fit pieces into a system well then you eliminate guys so you really want to find people that have in our coaching staff and you know the offensive and the defensive side have done a great job of finding that you know, using the players talents you know to, to be able to contribute and to contribute early that's why we draft and develop we tell them what the guys can do uh and and what the areas of concern are we've got to be exact on that so the coaches know when they put the guy in we at least know we're getting this and, and to your point I, from the DB position, it really feels like a lot of these de- these defensive uh, backs are they have the ability to press. They, it seems like it's an emphasis on press. Do you is that a, do you think that's a result of just how the game's being played on the offensive side of the ball? Also, too, the, the length of cornerbacks now. From my understanding, like being under six foot was well, being under six foot wasn't a huge deal, but these guys are like six two, lengthy, long arms, and it's it's almost like a norm now. What what do you think about that that change in in the cornerback position? You know, I think college football is so spread out and it's mm-hmm. played so differently, and you know, you have all these different schemes. It's the hurry up pace there's a lot of different things that you have to be able to slow the offense down so how can i slow the offense down by delaying releases by doing certain things that's why the corners you see longer corners and the athletes now you know back in the day you'd see a six foot corner and you would say they can't bend they They can't can't change direction (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's incredible the the event like it's saying 320 pounders run under five flat. You know, it's the chemicals in the milk or something. I don't know what it is. That's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's the almond milk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody drinking almond milk, oat milk, everything now. I, I'm fascinated with how you, how do you handle outliers? You know, it, how do you Bryce Young being the ultimate outlier with this size? We've never seen. Uh, you know, the, the stat is the last 25 years have been 301 quarterbacks drafted, two were under six foot and under 200 pounds. So yeah. we're talking about complete outlier. But even a guy, okay, Peter Skaronsky, mm-hmm. the, the left tackle, who has great left tackle tape, but his arms are probably going to be 32 and a quarter, 32 and a half. So how do you handle those outliers where he does it in, in not just those two players specifically, but maybe a player doesn't hit the exact arm length that you're looking for, or uh, you know the testing might not match up perfectly, but you know what? The tape shows a darn good football player. How, how, do, how do you balance that? I mean, you look at the production, you got to throw it all into the mix, and there's you know, reasons why guys perform. There's, um, you know, if, if, if um, like my father used to say, just because uh, said, he would say that 
blind people hear better. Okay, so depending upon your deficiencies, yeah. you develop some way to overcome and to be able to do what your job is. Um, it's like looking at every situation, looking at guys, and trying to go through the steps of. You know, how did this guy achieve this? Who was he playing against? Da, da, da. And there's some people that are just outliers. We're playing the percentage game, but there are some people that are outside of that percentage, and then you have to value that. Yeah. Overall, I need you to just cancel the rest of your day. Yeah. You're not, you're, you don't need anything else to do. You're just going to sit here and talk football with us that for the next be, hour. Is that, that great? That would be great. I would okay, have to do cool. interviews till 11 o'clock. Yeah. Will, Will's got, yeah, you would probably make that switch any day. Will's got to go. Thank you so much for taking some time. This was awesome as always. Good luck the rest of the way. Go find some good good players for us. How about that? And food. There he goes. And food. (laughs) There's Will McClay. We'll be back with more of the draft show right after this. Hey, Cowboys fans. If you're looking for a full-time or part-time job, check out Liberty Tax, proud partner of the Dallas Cowboys. If you've got tax experience and want to help your community with their finances, you're the perfect candidate. No tax experience? We also offer in-person tax school courses locally. Liberty Tax has 79 locations across DFW and 2,300 offices nationwide. Learn more about our job opportunities at libertytax.com slash hiring or call your local Liberty Tax office today. Craving something flavorful? Replace that bloated burrito feeling with Smoothie King's new Power Meal Smoothies. With three delicious flavors like cinnamon banana, blueberry raspberry, and spinach pineapple, you can fill up on flavor, not calories. Each meal replacement smoothie is packed with 20 grams of protein, 7 grams of fiber, and 23 vitamins and minerals, all under 350 calories with 0 grams of added sugar. So next time you want something flavorful, swap fast food for a Power Meal smoothie. Order today on the Smoothie King app. Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. I'm Darren Woodson, former Dallas Cowboy player and Super Bowl champion. When I played in the NFL at a high level, I relied on my vision to see the field. As I started getting older, I noticed my vision wasn't as good, and I was getting frustrated from wearing my glasses all day. I went to Laser Care Eye Center, and Dr. G talked about all the options. Thanks to technology and Laser Care Eye Center, I can see near, far, and between. Don't fumble your vision any longer. Visit them at dfweyes.com and tell them Darren sent you. They got me back on my game. What do you call a group of grown men and women with their faces painted silver and blue who get together every week to share a three-hour-long ritual of jumping, sinking, and toasting Miller Lite and 10-gallon hats while yelling, how about them cowboys? You call it Miller Time in Dallas. Here's to the cowboys. Here's to the original light beer. It's Miller Time. Celebrate responsibly. 2021 Miller Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. This This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Welcome back into the Draft Show presented by Miller Lite, the only beer of the Dallas Cowboys. It's Miller time and it's draft time here on the Draft Show. We've got Dane Brugler, Aisha Morrison, Kyle Yeomans. We just wrapped up with Will McClay. Great as always. I mean... Anytime you get to pick the brain of the guy who really runs the draft ship for the Dallas Cowboys, it's always going to turn into something. And he doesn't always want to really give out a ton of information, but he gave out some really good stuff there. I really value his perspective. <laughs> uh, just, you know, the the position that he's in, the experience that he has, you know, because he's player, coach, evaluator. Like he's He brings a really diverse uh, background to his job. And, you know, I was just asking him how how his job has evolved over time and what he looks for and you know how he handles outliers all those things. it was just a really fun conversation yeah. what did you think oh yeah i mean it was dope hearing him talk about just the process man it, it's so it sounds so thorough and just step by step by step by step and i was i also just liked hearing him talk about how the cowboys want to make their own decisions they want to make form their own opinions like yeah we value some of the information that's been given but he talked about coming to the combine he was like we're trying to put get definitive information you know based off of the stuff that we've been thinking or searching or researching so i just i enjoyed hearing about kind of the process and Barnacles. It's, it's one of them. I like. <laughs> well, and, and like I said, Will McClay is really, really good at saying a lot, but saying a little. And that's something he's done throughout his career. It's part of why he's good at this job throughout his career. One thing he did say there that I've, I've never really heard of, but you can see a trend with, was when asked about your outlier question. I love yeah. that question, by the Such way. Such a good question. When, when weighing the outlier liars, he said, we value the production. Right off the bat, that was his first couple of words. Production, production, production. 
you can see that with the trends that they've drafted with throughout the years. You talk about guys like Trayvon Diggs, Tyler Smith, well, Micah Parsons. I think it's important to point out that production doesn't always just mean what's in the stat sheet. Sure. Production can be, you know, watching him on the field and seeing – Okay, he's creating disruption out there, or you know, he's getting the job done. It, it, production's not just oh, did he have at least ten sacks? You yeah. know, so when he, I, I do believe when he said production, it wasn't just speaking of just the stat sheet for sure. And it looks like uh, there's a lot of times that Cowboys Nation will look at it and say traits are what they look to the most, and traits are a an add, all added element. Teams, you could say that about. You yeah. look at traits. That, that's always going to be the case, or else we wouldn't have even asked the, the conversation about shorter players yeah. and undersized players. But the the production, the way that he sounded like he, he was weighing it is that the production outweighs the traits, which is an interesting thought process. Yeah, something something yeah. that not a ton of teams do, I mean, but some teams certainly rely on it. Well, and, okay, Tyler Smith last year, um, I talk about the traits. He certainly had those traits that you're looking for. Um, but, you know, it was a little bit up and down. But you look at the production, you look at the good things that he did, and you're like, you know what, we're willing to bet on that, mm -hmm. that with some added coaching, he's going to get better and better and better. And so um, and it was also interesting, you know, kind of alluded to this, but how what's good for them uh, might not be good for somebody else. Yes. And, you know, they, they're they drafting for one team, one culture, one uh, roster, the way things are. It, it's going to be different than what another team's looking for. And so, you know, we I think we seem to – in the draft space, you know, okay, well, this guy's clearly the top receiver. Or this guy's, you know, it, it's this. There's no such thing as a consensus when it comes to the draft. Yeah. And there's no such thing because every team is looking for something a little bit different that suits them, that that, that fits their strengths. So, you know, I, I think that he, he that's something I, I think he made sure to point out. Yeah, and he talked about even the locker room fit. Like we talked mm -hmm. about it before we even started recording, just how important. The locker room fit is too. Is this gentleman's personality going to fit in with the guys that we already have here? You don't want someone coming in disrupting, you know, some of the chemistry that you have. So we were talking about just how you kind of pay attention to how they interact with their peers, how they are at the podium when they're here. He also mentioned NIL and just how that that was super dope. Because well, yeah. I, I, hopefully we can get into that. But Let's that's do just, it. yeah, I I would I wanted you guys' thoughts on like I'm still learning about NIL and all that stuff, but. How do you think it's affected how the scouting process goes and even the drafting process goes? I would say even more so like the transfer portal, you know, because I think it was, uh, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago, if a, a guy couldn't, was blocked on the depth chart and he transferred, it's like, oh, does this guy, is he afraid of competition? Yeah. You know, like, it, it, but now it's like, okay, I don't blame him for going to go to a better situation where he could get on the field, show what he can do. And so, I, I, I yeah, the mindset has really changed because of, the way the college football game has changed. Yeah. Uh, you know, either you evolve with things or you're going to be stuck uh, playing catch up because in the college game, very different than the NFL game, and there's so many different things you have to weigh. NIL, just another one. And everybody is still learning the sure. NIL, the transfer portal, whether it's collegiately or at the professional level as well. You, you talk about the adjustments that need to be made there. Not everybody will adjust the same. Everybody's going to have a different opinion on how to hit it, at least at first, and then it's a copycat league. Everybody will kind of come together on a consensus. Based off of what you've seen the last couple of years for the Cowboys, do you feel like they're in a good spot to make those adjustments compared to the rest of the 30, uh, 31 other teams? Yeah, and I, I think that they, okay, you know, we've we talked about in the past how the Cowboys, um, you know, like they're not going to draft a, a defensive tackle in the first round. Yeah. Or we've talked about how, uh, you know, there's certain trends, whether it be they're not going to draft a small school player. And I think it's important to pay attention to those trends. But it's also important to, you know, understand that they just they want to get better and they want to you know, get the players that are going to best fit this team and best get them, make them a better roster. So um, I, it's important to have an open mind to who they might go after, especially in a draft like this where, um, you know, you're again picking later in the first round. We don't know how those first 25 picks are going to play out. Um, you know, last year, it, it, you know, Tyler Smith would have been different out, outlook if a certain, you know, say Zion Johnson's still available yeah. or, you know, how does that change things? And so, um, you know, I think it's important just to have an open mind to how they might be attacking this specific draft. Yeah, and when you talk about well, the last couple of years, I do feel like in the first round, they've taken best player available for them. Yeah. Like when yeah. you mentioned Tyler Smith, like he, he mentioned here, Will McClay, like a lot of people had different opinions about Tyler Smith, but they felt like 
this guy is a good get fit mm-hmm. for us and it actually paid dividends for them because of his flex that they felt like he had that we i know i wasn't too sure about myself so sure. so yeah. so best to your point best player available to us may not be best player available to them yeah mm-hmm. and, and you know like a lot of that comes from the the interviews the meetings you know understanding hey, is this guy really going to put everything he has into being the best version of himself? Because you know, if you don't believe that with Tyler Smith, you can't draft him. Right. If you don't think that he's going to work and put his best foot forward and try to get every ounce of talent that he has out of, that, out of his ability, you just can't draft him in the first round. But obviously... Through their interactions, through their meetings and interviews, um, you know they felt like he would do that, and that's something that, you know, the interview process is different from team to team with the questions they ask or you know what, how they feel about the player. So you know that's just another wrinkle to the whole evaluation process that uh, makes it a very inexact science and different from team to team. Oh, and it makes the interviews that much more imperative too the, sure. the the one-on-one the scouting department getting to sit down and will mcclay getting to sit down and talk with them up until 11 o'clock at night like you said mm-hmm. a little bit earlier with that being said there are some confirmed cowboys meetings that we have had throughout the interview process this week i'll name some of these guys felix on dk uzama from kansas You've state been practicing i have been practicing thank you Derek hall out of alabama linebacker day on henley oh auburn that's yeah. i meant to say alabama i mean i meant to say auburn Dayon Henley out of Washington State, DeMarvian Overshone out of Texas, Emmanuel Forbes from Mississippi State, Joey Porter Jr. from Penn State, Trey Dean from Florida, J.L. Skinner from Boise State, and Israel Abanaconda. Mm-hmm. Got it again. Yeah. Running back. So what do you think about this short list of names? This is still very, this is what, one, two, three, four, five, that's like seven or eight names out of 80, or not 80, 45 formals and countless right. informal interviews. So what do you think? Interesting names there. I mean, we we've talked about Emmanuel Forbes uh, you know, quite a bit before, but you know he's he's a guy that with that body type, you just it, it, every team's gonna look at it a little bit differently. Uh, it, we'll see what he officially weighs in at here at the combine, but probably we're talking under seven hundred and seventy five pounds yeah. for a guy that's gonna be six one and a half, six two. Um, you know that's that's we talk about outliers, we talk about certain thresholds that each team wants. How are teams going to look at that? Um, so with Emmanuel Forbes, when you sit down and interview him, just finding out, hey, is this just your body type? Is this, you know, trying to get a better understanding of, uh, you know, the growth potential there? So um, that that's interesting. A um, couple first round, uh, potential first rounders on there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joey Porter Jr. Um, you know, he's, he's a really interesting corner who I don't think it's out of the top 20, 24 picks, but you never know. He's... He's a guy that is a true press corner. Uh, he wants to get up, park his chin right underneath uh, the uh, the receiver, and he's going to make contact, and he's going to ride that receiver up and down the field. So um, a certain type of corner compared to maybe some of these other guys who maybe offer a little more versatility. Yeah, and with with the, all the visits they had, it looks like there's DB's a thing. DB mm-hmm. in general is a thing. I mean, well, there's five on that list alone. Yeah. Uh, three corners, two safeties. JL Skinner being one of them. I was actually Boise State. Boise State. You know, you know, Cowboys got the Boise State fever. That's a thing. By the way, I, with <laughs> JL Skinner, I've never seen a safety with an identical body type as AJ Green, the receiver. Yeah, I, it's 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 uncanny. It's identical. It's the six four or six three and three quarters, whatever it is. Um, but the, how lean he is, like through his legs, like there, he doesn't have calves. It, it's, it, it, it's, it, I don't know. Sorry. I know the feeling. Look, 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 look. Sorry, sorry. Uh, it, but it's just, it's just uncanny how he's identical body type. So, All right, sorry, cut. No, 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 no. I was. That's just one of the things that I definitely noticed. Like the Cowboys clearly understand that they yeah. need to get more deep. I was surprised by, not surprised, but the D, some of the DNs. Uh-huh. I, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying I don't think that DN is not like a need or anything like mm-hmm. that. But some of these guys are are gentlemen. Like you know, I don't want to mess up his name. Derek Hall, Byron Young. Yeah. I those. I'm like, okay. Can you say Felix? I'm say Felix. He's, he's the DK professional. Uzama. There you go. Yeah. I got you. Felix on your DK Azama. Mm, mm, so I'm well, at the practice. That's now. a good. That's a good thing though because you look at edge rusher. What does the future look like for a Demarcus Lawrence? Right. Dorrance Armstrong is going into a final year. They can maybe extend him if they really wanted to. You've got Micah. That contract's coming up too. So drafting edge rusher isn't out of the question. It's probably not an overall arching need. It's not going to be a first round, second right. round pick. 
But if there's a quality edge rusher, maybe middle of the draft, and all three of those names aren't first round names yeah. for the most part. Probably not, but you know, it, edge rusher is always weird because yeah. you know it, it's a premium position. Sure. Mm-hmm. So there's no such thing as having too many of those guys, mm-hmm. uh, especially with the way that you know defenses work these days and sub and uh, you just want to get guys get get guys that can get on get to the quarterback on the field you know we, nobody knows that better than the cowboys with michael parsons who is not your traditional uh edge rusher but sure. you know what he can get to the quarterback and so you figure out a way to make that happen and so if they find another guy like that a quarterback hunter uh you know i i think you you know you at least consider that in the first round um because I, I i think it's important we don't you know, you don't narrow your focus in the first round and say, you know, we have to get a corner. Okay. We have. That's what this team has gotten in trouble in the past. You know, <clears throat> Taco. Um, Bye. That, Bye. That, that's where this team has gotten in trouble in the past, where they say we need to get X position here in the first round. And oh man! You have to keep your, uh, you know, you have to make sure you're drafting the best player at a, an impact position that's going to help your roster. In fairness, I really do feel like since Mike McCarthy has been here, that that is kind of fizzled out. Also, too. Dan Quinn, like, you can mm. see his influence on, on these past few drafts. Now, I will ask you guys. So, DT is something that I definitely feel like is a is a need, given the fact that you've seen with the Cowboys, I feel like they've drafted guys that had pass rush ability on also Diggy mm-hmm. Zuas. Like, those gentlemen that have pass rush ability, Neville, Neville Gallimore. But having Hankins come in this past year and be a true nose seemed to really help this defensive line. Not sure if he's coming back next season. Is there a DT that you're like, you know what, man? That is maybe <laughs> that that you're okay with. Besides, you know, the obvious that you're okay with maybe at a first round because we didn't get to talk to him about that. Mm. But it was clear that Hankins at a, as a nose and just having a true nose made a huge difference in the run defense right. and just the edge rushers being free, being able to stunt all that stuff. So. What, how do you guys feel about that? Are you, are you talking about a true nose or any type of defensive tackle? I mean, a de- when we talk about the last few drafts and the way that they've drafted, I feel like they've drafted guys at the DD position that had that could get up field. Right. Yeah. But that has not helped serve them in run defense. Mm-hmm. So do you shift your thinking as a coordinator or in your scouting like, hey, we love guys that like to rush the passer from that position – but it's hurting our run defense. Mm-hmm. Do you right. now convert to we have enough edge rushers or we're going to put stock in the edge rushers and we're going to really get some gentlemen in here that can clog up this middle of this defense? That's why I was asking. And, and I think that, no, it's a great question. I think it's ideally you try to find the guys that can help you in both areas. You yeah. know, the, the interchangeable, like if you want to kick them inside, play them as a, as a nose or a one, uh, you know, he can handle a double team. But you also want to be able to keep him if you want him over the B gap and you want him getting upfield, he can attack gaps. Um, so, you know, a guy like uh, Keanu Benton from Wisconsin. I don't know if you've watched him yet. Yeah, he's, he's, one of my- <laughs> yeah he's, a, he's a good player who he was a nose at Wisconsin, but you feel like there's pass rush potential there. So I think ideally for a team like this, that should be the, you know, who you're who you're gunning for. The and, guys that could play either role. And who you I completely agree with that because that's what Dan Quinn has shown. I mean, he's basically like, give me a guy, I'm going to make him work. I'm yeah. going to make it work. The only place that that hasn't necessarily happened is the interior of the defensive line. That's what I'm saying. And, yeah. and it's not because the Neville Gallimans of the world aren't the best players. Yep. It just might not fit what they're trying to do with the interchangeability. So versatility could work. Neville Gallimore's not going to be a one tech. He's not going right. to line up on the nose. He's not going to have that ability. Oso Digizua is great as a pass rusher as a three tech, but he's also not going to be a nose. Go get you a guy who's got that versatility, but maybe with, with a little bit more of a nose tackle background. Because who made the biggest impact on the run defense this year? Jonathan Hankins. Mm. Yes. Big, burly nose tackle. He was only a nose tackle, but he's the one that really made the biggest impact throughout the season. Well, if they want to know more about um, Keanu Benton, they just need to go call up Jake Ferguson. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were roommates for a little bit there. Yeah, uh, and he mentioned going up against Tyler Biotis in yep. practice and, exactly. and how they talk and iron sharpens iron. Yep. Like, that Wisconsin offensive line, obviously, is they're known for their offensive line. So for Keanu to be going toe-to-toe with them, mm-hmm. I think helped improve this game. He was a lot smaller than what I thought he was going to be. He's not no Benton. small guy. Yeah, but yeah. when he was at the podium, I, he plays I'm going to tell you said that. Don't go, nah, man. Please do. Don't get me. No. Please do. He just. It's like I, her favorite player. It was like the first draft show. He was one of the show. first guys I was yeah. looking at. But he just, he, I just expected to see this like 
burly mm. human, and he's yeah. he's pretty lean to be as big as he is. He, you know he's got a, he's got a big body, but he's he's not like three. He's not Mozzie Smith, who's you know three thirty, three 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 five. He's more three fifteen. Um, he might even slim down even more here uh, to so he can run better. Um, so yeah, we'll. Fi- I don't. Yeah, I guess he did measure this morning, but I haven't seen an official. Okay. Uh, wait for him yet. What do you think about Mozzie Smith's fit? I know we talked a little bit about him yesterday, but you think about the versatility between a one and a three. Could yeah. he do both? Both, potentially? He, yeah, I mean, he's not just a strictly a stocky plugger. You know, yeah. I, you're not, yeah. but that's what he does best in terms of taking on doubles, and he's so good with his leverage, the way he understands it. He, like, every player has a level of play strength or power. Mozzie Smith accesses his power better than most players in this draft having the understanding of your body and how to access that power to maximize it he's so good at that so um yeah i i, I think that that's what makes mozzie a potential first round pick in this draft yeah this is a second straight day we've talked about smith and everything you're saying is just blinking light to me Blink- i mean i know it's early yeah. i know it's early but that just sounds like a fit i I don't know if it's the fit of 26. We mm. we have a long way to go up until that, but at least in the early couple days, I think Combine, a lot of that's the first one. I think a lot of mind. teams are thinking that way too, though. They that's are. A, you know to, to add a maybe not the flashiest player, but sure. to add someone that you're just going to plug in, it's going to help everybody else in that front seven. Um, you're going to help your run defense from day one. So yeah, I, I do think there'll be several teams looking at that in that late one, early two window and saying, hey. Maybe not the sexiest pick, but man, he's going to make us a better team. Yeah, and and Carl Brooks from uh, Bowling, Bowling Green, Green is, yeah. is also a guy that has some versatility. They used him on the outside. They yeah. used him. They pushed him into the inside. Now I do feel like he not had, here, by the way. No. The biggest combine snub this year. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah, he didn't he got come. snubbed. Warner. Didn't get invited. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that wild. Doesn't mean he won't get drafted. But no, no, it, no. But it was a big snub. Yeah, like I, I guess I was actually looking for him, but he's hard to get hands on as yeah. well. And I think he is also a guy that has some pass. Ru- he can develop into a better mm-hmm. pass rusher, but he has some nose ability, and you can move him across the line. I thought he was a guy that maybe you can keep your eye out for him. Now he's only three oh five, which is not tiny. Mm-hmm. But with him being out used on the outside and stuff, I think that has to do with his size. So I guess it depends on what a team wants from him. But I was just right. saying when you talk about. A versatile, you know, DT that maybe can do that as well. Maybe and you know, guy. Brian Broaddus is listening to this, and he's just thinking so many harsh things to us right now about position flex. We're not talking about position flex. We're talking about versatility, Brian. Versatility. Hey, versatility man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tax season can be more stressful than a last second Hail Mary. With the game on the line, overcome your taxiety today with Liberty Tax, a proud partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Book an appointment at libertytax.com slash cowboys. When we come back, we're going to do some Twitter on the 20, and we'll wrap up draft show coverage here from the combine in 2023 presented by miller light we'll be back in just a moment twitter on the 20 i'm Dak prescott quarterback of the dallas cowboys blockchain.com is one of the most trusted ways to buy sell and trade crypto whether you're always on the go or stay closer to home blockchain.com is just a few taps away put the power of crypto in your pocket so no matter where you are you can trade on your terms and build a crypto portfolio to fit your life For crypto pros, rookies, and anyone in between, Blockchain.com makes it easy to own a piece of the future. Blockchain.com, trusted by millions, trusted by America's team. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. What do you call a group of grown men and women with their faces painted silver and blue who get together every week to share a three-hour-long ritual of jumping, sinking, and toasting Miller Lite and 10-gallon hats while yelling, how about them cowboys? You call it Miller Time in Dallas. Here's to the cowboys. Here's to the original light beer. It's Miller Time. Celebrate responsibly. 2021 Miller Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. Star Sports Tours is the only official fan travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys, offering exclusive game weekend travel packages with pregame sideline access and photo ops with current players, cheerleaders, and cowboy legends. You want to stay at a team hotel? Attend the best tailgate party in Texas? 
Tour the Star and talk X's and O's with me, Everson Walls. With Star Sports Tours, you can. Visit CowboysTravel.com to book your travel package today. This This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Action-packed motorsports experience in the world returns to Arlington this Sunday. Head to AT&T Stadium on March 4th for Monster Jam. Tickets are on sale now at SeatGeek.com, the official ticketing provider of AT&T Stadium. I know you're bummed that you're going to be out here in Indianapolis. You're going to miss Monster Jam, Dane. Yeah, that's all right. They come to they come to Northeast Ohio, so I'll, I'll, I'll get a chance. It's to just not AT and T Stadium. That's true. You know, that's, it's that's the, uh, the, the ambiance. The <laughs> I, I tell you what, I was fascinated the first time I ever uh, saw that stadium with just dirt in it. And yeah. Like, oh my! Wow! Like that's uh, the operations people there, man. They they do some, good, some big time work. No I've doubt. never been to nothing like that. Is it's it my, wild. Like the monster it cards. It's awesome. Tricks? Yeah. I want to go to there. That'd be fun. Yeah. They had like motocross there last week, big event, and then they had the. Uh, they have monster trucks all the time. Take some headphones or some yeah. earplugs just in case because it's, it's that bad. It's loud. My, oh, it's no. fun. We, we took my six-year-old and he cried the entire time. Oh, that's no. going to be me. Never mind. Oh, no. That's what I'm going to do as soon as we're done with this segment because it's our last segment here for the draft show at the Combine. Dane Brugler, Aisha Morris, and I'm Kyle Yeomans. Let's wrap up with a little bit of Twitter on the 20. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Twitter on the 20. All right. Brandon said, who is one prospect that you think the Cowboys would regret passing on in the first round. I know, again, super early. Uh-huh. However, there's some names there that have been mentioned, kind of thrown into the mix. Is there one that sticks out that they could pass on and that they would regret it? I think the obvious name is Bijan. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's uh, that, that's one of those realistic, you could see him being there and you could see them passing. Um, and then you could realistically see Bijan having a uh, you know 1,500-yard rushing season as a rookie. And, I mean, that... That seems like the most obvious name there. Um, who's another less obvious name, maybe? Um, man, one of these receivers, yeah, I was maybe? About to say, I was maybe about a receiver. To say, I was going to say a receiver. Jordan Addison, maybe. Uh, you know, doesn't give you the size, but man, he can get open. He can he can make plays for you. So, what about one of these tight ends? I'm telling. I'm know? telling you, man. I, I I don't know about I don't know about that, but I know wide receiver. When you mention the size thing and mm-hmm. stuff like that, I think some of these speedy guys, like even like a Jalen Hyatt, who I think he's going to put the burners on plenty of times in this league, and we might look back and be like, dang, because he can just get, he can just run past people. Yeah. He can just get, and vertic- verticality is like, we see it with the Chiefs. Like mm-hmm. teams that can play vertical, they're, they're flying past these DBs. It makes a difference. Speed is something that people want. So if they pass up on a speedy receiver, I think that that, would make me sad. Did you like Will's answer to that question, the way that he outlined it? It kind of it, it felt like you you kind of went around it a little bit. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. And I've, I expected him to do so. Sure. I asked the question just to throw it out there. Maybe he'd give us a little nugget. But it kind of felt like he didn't want to address, yes, we will draft it if it's the right guy. Didn't really sound like he that. He didn't want to touch wide receiver like that. <laughs> he was not falling for it. Well, I... I Talking about, like, okay, tight ends, for example. Like, how do you, you know, talking to Will about it, asking about oh, first-round tight ends, waiting on tight ends. Um, it's, it's a really interesting philosophy because this is a team that um, uh, the last first-round tight end was... Matt LaFleur. Matt LaFleur with 98. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, and the last tight end they drafted top 50 was... Gavin Escobar over 10 years ago. Wow. So, you know, it's it's a position they like to wait on. Uh, we've seen it time and time again the last few years. So, and they've had decent, you know, think Dalton Schultz and, you know, what he's brought to the team. And so it's not like they've totally struck out do it with that uh, mindset. But it'll be interesting if uh, one, you know, going back to the original question about are they going to regret passing it, if they're top tight end, whoever that may be, whether it's Michael Mayer, whether it's Dalton Kincaid, Luke Musgrave, Darnell Watt, whoever is their top tight end, if he's there in the first round, that will be awfully tempting to go ahead and just take him right there. But, you know, it could be something they end up regretting if they pass. I, I wanted to ask you guys, since we're talking about tight end, you got two... Two tight ends right now, right now, and, and um, sorry, Peyton, Peyton Hendershot, Hendershot yep. and Jake Ferguson that both have the receiving qualities, kind of the, you know, like they both are, blo- they're both better at blocking now. But do you put a just a pure blocking tight end or a guy that is specialized in that? Do you mix it up or do you want to 
you think that they're going to continue to go the route of we kind of want a guy with some of that elusiveness, that receiving quality type stuff, or are they going to be in a place to where they're more like maybe when we want a guy more like a Sean McC- mm-hmm. McCune who came in and is just really – active in the blocking game we talk about mike mccarthy talking about i want to run the ball i want to run the damn ball and he loves tight ends he loves six foot four exactly 250 plus guys he loves those types of guys on your football team. so i wonder if that plays a role in whether you go for a guy like a Kincaid, a, a Musgrave, instead of a Kincaid, right? Because of the blocking ability, or a Darnell want, Washington, or Darnell Washington, because, yes. But it, and then the question becomes: Okay, is the value there where we're drafting a sixth offensive lineman? Basically, Tracking. And, and it depends because every team's different. Because exactly, this, exactly. This scheme and the way that it's being talked about, and just kind of some of the things that Mike McCarthy liked to do before he don't play, yeah. your tight end's gonna block. Well, <laughs> what did you think about the way Will McClay answered the tight end question and the way he kind of addressed it? Because that might give you a little insight or zero insight it, it felt like they going to wait <laughs> it did right I, it felt like they're going to wait do you guys think this is a draft where you can wait i think so um I do too. Okay. yeah it, it, i think it's a really deep group uh, do you have a favorite uh, maybe after the first or second tier uh that you like i'm looking at a couple of guys not not sticking out Payne durham from purdue maybe good senior one bowl. of those guys yep. yeah he had a great senior bowl he did. um what do you think about Will Mallory out of Miami as a guy? Another senior bowl guy. Yeah. Uh, his tape just I don't know, left me wanting more. Really? Yeah. You know, I just uh, I, he looks he's a good looking athlete, but I don't know. I just wanted to see more out of him. Didn't I didn't love him as much as I thought. I a guy who if he falls to say like the fourth round, Luke Schoonmaker from Michigan okay. is a guy that yeah. I really like. He's uh, I don't think he gets enough credit for the athlete that he is, but he can also block. Um, and so I, Luke Schoonmaker from Michigan is a really good player who I, I have a third-round grade on him, but if he were to fall into that early fourth, maybe that's a, that's a guy the Cowboys would go get. That was somebody Brian mentioned on one of the previous shows because I marked it down BB, and I went back and watched a couple games. I, I, of told, I, I told like Brian. I'll, I'll, oh, you yeah, know, you let him know. Uh, he kind of uh, slipped him a note. No, Brian, Brian's got a good eye. Huh? <laughs> no, he does. But, uh, yeah, there's a couple guys there. What about Cameron Latu? as well yeah it's alabama solid. yeah i he, he was uh if, if the ball wasn't going to jameer gibbs bryce young was trying to find <laughs> uh <laughs> cameron latu uh he in, he did a nice job former pass rusher made that transition to uh tight end and I, I thought he did a nice job this year uh working in the middle of the field not a ton of yak not a ton of big plays but uh a guy that can work the middle of the field get open give you those little windows and so yeah he, he's also i think in that fourth fifth round range i actually feel like listening to some of the conversation i I think that laporta from iowa his his stock is not not gonna say it's dropping but i'm just saying that it doesn't seem like it's as hype as it was so i i feel like he could be a guy that's there in the later rounds now people are really hung up about his drops Mm. i think that was well you look at the iowa offense there was a lot going on there yeah, a lot a little of time. Bit, there was a little bit of a struggle there, wasn't there? a little there? bit of a struggle yeah. there sometime. I, I wonder if you get him with some coaching and see how he does or whatever. But he's one of the guys that I feel like in the, a lot of the conversation has started to, to not dwindle down, but it's not. I don't hear people as excited about him as opposed to some of these other tight ends because of the, the, the receiving ability and things like that. Here's a, a quote from a scout on Laporta. Thank you for um, saying that. I was ready for this. <laughs> Sam isn't quite Fant or Hawkinson, two former Iowa tight ends. Yes. But he's tougher than both of them. He competes like Kittle. Oh, wow. Wow. So, That's high praise. Yeah, very high praise. And so a guy that, yeah, he won't be as athletic as Hawkinson or, or Fan and, you know, be that imposing target out there. But he competes. I mean, this guy, he, he had a meniscus injury. Yep. And then he came back for the bowl game. How many, how many guys in today's, you know, college football seniors mm-hmm. have a meniscus injury and then are going to work their way back to get back on the – most guys are shutting it down. Yeah. Then, I mean – Especially injury yeah. prone, especially, yeah, especially something like that. Iowa, who's not playing for uh, the college football playoffs. Yeah. This is a guy that, I mean, you talk about grit, you talk about this, this that's what scouts talk about yeah. with uh, with Sam Laporta. So that's why I'll be shocked if he if he falls too far. I, I think that he's just, he's a guy you want in your locker room. Um, I, I still think somewhere top 100, I, I think Laporta ends no, up. No, but thank you for that information because yeah. that's what, that's literally what Will was just talking yeah. about. Is like we can watch all the film all day, but to hear the toughness, some of the behind the scenes stuff, just some of the things he's he's worked through, you know, throughout his career, puts some stuff in perspective for him. 
as a player yeah. for me. So yeah. thank you for that. This oh, is yeah. like a straight date. We've talked about tight ends as well. This might be well, a theme. It's, it's, it's a theme. Now I'm coming around, guys. Coming around. Because <laughs> when I first started watching them, I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> hey, sometimes that happens when you watch players. Some of these guys are exciting. Yeah. Some of these guys are exciting mm-hmm. to watch. So. Oh, man. Well, this has been a whole lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Three shows here over the last couple of days, a couple with our friend Dane Brugler from The Athletic. Be sure to check him out because the next time we'll probably hear from Dane, the Beast will probably be out there. Yeah, hopefully. What's the due date? What are you, what are you getting that out there? It's that first week in April. That's always the Woo. goal. Um, you know, really a month from now, hopefully, we're putting the final touches on. I want to get all the pro day information in there. Sure. And that goes up until that first week in April. Um, you know, it's important to get all that data in there. So it's the month of March. The month of March doesn't happen for me. It, oh, it's, yeah. it's just, uh, it's strictly finishing and watching these guys. Um, spring. Uh, yeah. Sunlight. <laughs> no, no such thing in March. Uh, but once the draft guide's out in April, then I can, uh, I'll hit send on that tweet that says, hey, guys, here it is. And then wait. put my phone down, take the dog for a walk, try to take a deep breath, come back, and my phone will be blowing up with, why'd you have him here? Why'd you have him? But it's, <laughs> that's all right. We'll deal with that then. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. You know what's crazy? I went to the draft last year on mm-hmm. my own before I started doing any of this. Mm-hmm. Funniest thing was people carrying around the beast like it was a Bible. They had it? Like 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 it was a Bible. Like it was it was so many people out there just yeah, that's funny. carrying it around. I'm like, that is not no Bible. The funny, like, it is, them, though. It basically is, it is like though. a football. No, it is. It's it, like it, a football it, Bible. It, I, I always enjoy when we, they show snapshots from a war room or an NFL team and, and it's there. you look and you say, oh there it is like, you know? <laughs> and then you have to all humble about it i mean uh, no yeah, big deal, yeah. no no big big deal. deal. Yeah. there's only a couple more years left of dame brugler doing this media stuff he's being a normal guy he's, gonna be, he's hey. gonna be interviewing like will mcclay kids. was i got young point. kids so yeah that's fair that's you know. fair <laughs> everything's on the table dane thanks so much well, it's always a pleasure we'll talk to you again down the line thank for you. aisha morrison i'm kyle yeomans for our producer alex Lilly behind the camera setting all of this up this week on radio row saying so long from Indianapolis. We'll see you back at the Star in Frisco on Wednesday with more of the Draft Show presented by Miller Lite. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!